Advocates for dignity and try and help people. But Washington says Turkey failed to present any evidence. Mr. Malka shot his star of detention. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar titled What's Really Happening in Afghanistan? My name is Mehmet Saral and I'm the president of the Advocates for Dignity, one of the two partnering organizations that are bringing this panel to you this evening. Advocates for Dignity is a non-for-profit advocacy organization that seeks to, the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental human rights and liberties, which also has a special focus on Turkey and its citizens abroad. This is AFD's fourth webinar panel this year and eighth since last year, since the COVID pandemic lockdowns hit Sydney. We had earlier last year conducted face-to-face -face lectures and programs, but these seem like a distant memory. Our partnering organization tonight, uh, Masood Foundation Australia, is a Sydney-based non-for-profit organization that's fostering an enduring relationship between Australians and the people of Afghanistan. So, the panel tonight, who's to blame for the Afghanistan chaos? International conflict in Afghanistan began in 2001, triggered by the September 11, 911 attacks, which are three days away, the anniversary of that, and consist consisted of three phases. The first phase, toppling the Taliban, which was brief and lasted just two months. And the second phase from 2002 to, to, until 2008 was marked by the US strategy of defeating the Taliban militarily and rebuilding core institutions of the Afghan state. And the third phase began in 2008 to temporarily increase the US troop presence in Afghanistan. This larger force was used to implement a strategy of protecting the population from Taliban attacks and supporting efforts to reintegrate insurgents into Afghan society. The strategy came coupled with a timetable for the withdrawal of the foreign forces from Afghanistan beginning in 2011. Security responsibilities would be gradually handed over to Afghan military and police. The US and NATO formally ended their combat mission in Afghanistan in 2014, but retained a reduced force of approximately 13,000 troops to support and train Afghan troops until a reduction was implemented in 2020. A full withdrawal of US troops initiated in 2020 and continued in 2021 anticipated the end of the US deployment to Afghanistan, but the resurgence of the Taliban during the withdrawal returned the country back to where it started when the US forces arrived 20 years earlier. In this webinar, former ABC Radio national host John Cleary will moderate a panel with Prof Professor Amin Saikal the adjunct professor of social sciences at the University of Western Australia and an expert on Middle East and Asian studies, and Professor William Malley, who's a professor of diplomacy at the Australian National University and an expert in Afghan politics, to explore the question, what's really happening in Afghanistan? While Professor Amin Saikal is of Afghan origin, Professor William Malley has written five books on Afghanistan, so we have the two experts here this evening to answer these questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the event. John Cleary is a veteran ABC, veteran ABC radio broadcaster and one of Australia's best known commentators on religion. In his 30 year career with the ABC, he has worked extensively in both radio and television, but is known principally for his association with Sunday nights on ABC local radio and the religion report on ABC Radio National. John began his career in Perth, where he was one of the original Compass team um, on ABC TV and co-presenter of the philosophy program Meridian on Radio National on, in the 1990s. For several years, John also appeared in a regular slot on the ABC Youth Network, 2 J. His 1992 book on the Salvation Army in Australia was awarded the Christian Book of the Year. And in 2008, John has hosted, uh, was the host of the interfaith event held by the Catholic Church in conjunction with World Youth Day and the visit of Pope Benedict XVI. These days, John is in high demand as a conference moderator. Over to you, John. Thank you. 
Mehmet, thank you very much. And welcome to this evening's discussion as events continue to unfold in Afghanistan by the hour. And as we all look to understand what's really happening and what it may mean for all of us. So let me uh, give you a few more details on our participants. Emeritus Professor William Malley is a past professor of diplomacy at ANU from 2003 to 2016. Amongst much else, he is the author, as Mehmet has indicated, of three books on Afghanistan. Rescuing Afghanistan in 2006, Transition in Afghanistan, Hope, Despair and the Limits of State Building in 2018, and most recently this year, 2021, The Afghanistan Wars. Professor Maley is a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences at the Australian Institute of International Affairs. He's a recipient of the Ostcare Paul Cullen Humanitarian Award for Services to Refugees. Our other participant is Emeritus Professor Amin Saikal. He also brings a rich history. He was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, and is currently adjunct professor in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Western Australia. He's a former director of the Centre for Arabic and Islamic Studies and a distinguished professor of political science at ANU. He's been a visiting fellow at Princeton and Cambridge Universities and at Rockefeller Foundation. Both Professor Seichel and Professor Maley are widely published and regularly sought of as commentators in print, radio and television, both in Australia and internationally. Welcome to you both. Good evening. I mean, Seichel, perhaps I can ask you first, uh, given the speed at which events are unfolding and the consequences known and unknown are yet to unfold, this evening presents an opportunity to gain some understanding of the background to and possible directions of those events. And today we've seen announced some form of government has been established by the Taliban. What do we know about the nature of that government and broadly some of the personalities? Well, thanks, John. I mean, uh, as you say, the Taliban uh, have announced uh, interim government, uh, which is composed of Prime Minister and a number of ministers. Uh, the Prime Minister is uh, Mullah Hassan Bokhund. Uh, he is uh, on the United Nations uh, blacklist uh, for unsavory activities in the past. And the Interior Minister is the head of the Haqqani Network, which was uh, uh, de designated by the United States as a terrorist organization a few years ago, and also uh, this uh, uh, Haqqani network has got very close links with Al-Qaeda as well as the Pakistan's powerful military intelligence, ISI. And he is uh, on the FBI uh, wanted list for terrorism and of course also for killing of a number of American soldiers uh, in, a, in a few operations in the past. So this is a very a, a, a terrible uh, uh, lineup that the Taliban has come up with. If they wanted to really gain the support of the Afghan people, or for that matter, any degree of international legitimacy, I think they've just simply botched it. I doubt it very seriously that uh, any country in the world, and more specifically the Western democracies, uh, will uh, find it uh, conducive uh, to uh, provide the support, or for that matter, recognition, to uh, the leadership, uh, which is uh, uh, very much full of uh, uh, accused terrorists or as, uh, erstwhile terrorists. Uh, and I think that's why that there is a resistance going on in Afghanistan. And I would expect that this resistance will get a pace as uh, uh, Taliban continue uh, their brutal theocratic uh, behavior in establishing that sort of order. Well, Professor Maley, perhaps I ought to ask you to come in on, on this. Uh, you know, there is a saying, uh, uh, yesterday's terrorists, today's patriots. Um, <laughs> we've seen it before. Yes, I don't think it will work out quite like that for the Taliban. Uh, Australia has a particular problem with Sirajuddin Haqqani because he was the mastermind of an attack on the Kabul Serena Hotel in 2008 at a time when the Australian Embassy was actually physically located within that uh, hotel. Uh, the uh, lineup of individuals in this uh, sort of so-called government um, is in a sense a signal that the Taliban are really indifferent to the concerns of the wider world. There had been quite a lot of talk mm -hmm. 
what you might call the peace industry to the effect that the Taliban would be desperate for recognition uh, and that uh, the prospects of international aid being withheld if they didn't moderate their behaviour would lead them to do just that. This seems highly unlikely now. It's very clear that uh, rewarding different factions within the Taliban has uh, dominated any international concerns where cabinet making is concerned uh, and uh, made it very, very difficult for Western governments that might have been contemplating developing some kind of pragmatic relationship uh, with the Taliban to go any further than that. Uh, in the Australian case, Australia only recognises states, not governments, so there's not an immediate challenge for Australia, but it's very difficult to see how governments in Europe, for example, would uh, um, go anywhere near this particular group. Uh, uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani was behind a big bombing uh, that destroyed the facade of the German embassy uh, in Kabul uh, a few years ago and was known to have that particular role. So really it's a, a slap in the face for Western governments and potential Western donors for this kind of uh, uh, regime to be presented, quite apart from the fact that it's manifestly not inclusive at all, exclusively male, Pashtun dominated. There's not even a, a, a vestige of concessions towards inclusivity in this particular lineup. Uh, and again, that uh, is a blow to uh, people who naively thought that the Taliban would be reaching out to other social groups in Afghanistan. Mm. Well, perhaps I could ask you both to help us with the background of this. I mean, historically, um, to any number of school children of, uh, of a certain era, uh, Afghanistan was known as the graveyard of empires. I mean, the British failed at Kabul in the 1840s when a badly wounded Dr. William Bryden, lone survivor of a British army of some 16,000, reached Jalalabad and was asked, where's the army? And he responded, I am the army. And in our own era, the, the Soviets failed in the 1980s. Now the US seems to have failed. Are there common threads here that relate to the nature of the peoples and the, the very nature of the way the country as a country has operated um, in a series of ethnic and religious enclaves? Or, or how, for those of us who don't understand, has the country succeeded in being what it has for so long? Uh, I'm in cycle. Well, John, Afghanistan is the only country in the world that has been invaded by the three major powers of the last two centuries. And as you pointed out, Great Britain, and then, of course, the Soviet Union in the 1980s, and then the United States and its NATO allies in 2001. And uh, the, of course, they stayed for much longer, the Americans and their allies stayed for much longer in Afghanistan than the Brits did, or for that matter, the Soviets. I think that it does say something very profound about the nation of the Afghan society, that despite of all their shortcomings, whether it is in political terms or cultural terms, or for that matter, in terms of the overall development, and the reconstruction. They have been a very freedom loving people in a lot of ways, and they have not really accepted foreign impositions. But this is really the first time that uh, Pakistan has really succeeded in backing a proxy force which has managed to, to gain control over Afghanistan. But that's because of the very strong cross border relationship between the ethnic Pashtuns, who have historically constituted something like about 42% of the Afghan population, and they've never really been a majority. Uh, in fact, Afghanistan is truly the land of minorities, and there is no majority group. And uh, of course, there's cross-border uh, uh, relationship uh, between the uh, ethnic Pashtuns in Afghanistan and also the ethnic Pashtuns on the Pakistani side of the border. Of course, Pakistan has got um, three times more Pashtuns than Afghanistan. And the Pakistanis have always really thought of Afghanistan as an area where they can uh, uh, cultivate or build uh, their strategic interests. And uh, that has also largely been motivated by uh, Pakistan's uh, conflict with India 
and the Pakistanis have finally have gained in many ways the upper hand by enabling their, their proxy force uh, to gain control of Afghanistan, which it means that also has an indirect control of uh, Pakistan over Afghanistan. So in many ways, this is a really uh, a, a Pakistan backed invasion of Afghanistan. And this is not something really new. The Pakistanis really tried, tried it uh, after the Soviet withdrawal um, uh, uh, in, in backing uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar's group uh, as a protege in order to gain full control of, over Afghanistan. Or what the, uh, General Ziaul Haq has said, uh, the, the strategic depth so that uh, uh, they will have uh, sufficient influence in a country like Afghanistan that in the event of a war with India, they will be able to rely on Afghanistan as a job, uh, uh, as a backup uh, in order to confront the main regional foe that is India. So uh, I think this is probably the first time that uh, perhaps uh, the Pakistanis uh, have succeeded more than any other foreign power to actually have a very strong cross-border um, proxy force uh, to uh, uh, control Afghanistan. I'd like to pick up on that uh, Pakistan observation in a few moments' time. But just before we do that, uh, uh, Professor Maley, just on the, the composition of Afghanistan as a country, if it is as regionally independent as seems to be indicated, what does this mean for the Taliban, hoping to get some form of centralised government operating out of Kabul? Well, the Taliban have stated very clearly that they aim for a centralised state rather than a diversified state. I think they're going to run into a lot of difficulties, uh, not just because the desire to centralise tends to run against the desire for people in different uh, communities within Afghanistan to run their own lives, but because the Afghanistan in which they're operating now is a very different one. Uh, it's much more globalised than was the case 20 years ago, and the Taliban and uh, with their Pakistani spearhead are much more configured to attack than to govern. Uh, and uh, that's why I suspect that they're having a considerable difficulty now coping with the popular demonstrations that are breaking out in different parts of Afghanistan in objection to the kind of repressive policies which they're trying to impose. It's worth noting that in 2019, the Asia Foundation conducted a very sophisticated survey in Afghanistan, which found that 85.1% of respondents had no sympathy at all for the Taliban. Uh, and uh, that is part of the context within which the Taliban are now trying to assert control. Um, it's very clear to people within Afghanistan what's been going on, and we've seen demonstrators in uh, Kabul chanting death to Pakistan uh, in reflection of their clear understanding that this has been a creeping invasion of Afghanistan. This is where I think the current situation also differs from the situation in the 1980s. There was support given to the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviets, but the Mujahideen were uh, an internal indigenous movement uh, animated by uh, Afghan concerns whereas the Taliban have been much more a tool of Pakistan's geopolitical objectives within the region. Uh, and that has provoked a great deal of anger on the part of people within the Afghan population who are now much more networked to the wider world than ever was the case in the past. So uh, under those circumstances, I think whilst we may not see the same kind of opposition that was manifested in the 1980s, the Taliban are quite likely to run up against what social scientists have called contentious politics, the politics of protests and demonstrations, uh, which can be very difficult to manage because they don't necessarily depend upon there being a single leadership that can be decapitated. Um, mm. They are often a product of spontaneous anger, which is only likely to mount in Afghanistan because of the deteriorating economic circumstances with a uh, few, if any, international donors wanting to let any of their money fall into the hands of the Taliban. Can we speak about any strong regional differences, say, for instance, between the urban concentrations of the larger cities and the rural population? Are there any, is the Taliban influence different in, in those centres, in that divide? Well, possibly, but one would want to avoid exaggerating that. I saw an American journalist the other day talking about the two Afghanistans, and I thought, oh, only two. 
uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of social change in Afghanistan in recent years, a lot of people moving into the cities that uh, uh, there are now millions of Afghans living in urban areas rather than in rural areas. And it's often the control of urban spaces, which is critical to the establishment of a regime's reputation for uh, ex exercising domination. Uh, there's also been work done by the Afghanistan Analyst Network, which suggests that the notion that rural women are sort of happy with their lot uh, and aren't represented by the views of their urban um, sisters really doesn't stack up. That it's That's very much a kind of comment that Western male journalists have made without actually having the opportunity to engage as extensively as more sophisticated researchers with, uh, uh, with women in rural areas. Uh, Media like television and mobile phones have been penetrating quite rapidly into rural areas in Afghanistan, and that begins to change the nature of social relations. I think, John, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that the Obama administration made uh, when it uh, changed American policy from counterterrorism to counterinsurgency, that this was the end of 2009, and was putting a lot of emphasis on the protection of the major population centers as against the rural area. And that meant that it actually uh, that policy left the rural areas wide open for the Taliban uh, to occupy. And then to subsequently, that really helped them to basically surround the uh, um, major population centers. And that's simply choke those population centers. And that was one of the reasons that some of these uh, uh, population centers uh, f fell very easily to the to the Taliban over the last uh, few weeks. And of course, there's also mm, a lot of um, uh, money changed hands because a number of commanders were bribed and the Taliban have done that before. The, uh, Afghanistan has been prone to that sort of thing uh, historically, uh, uh, but uh, and a number of other uh, to, uh, commanders uh, just simply uh, sided with that uh, Taliban for ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic, on the basis of ethnic relationships and so on. But I think one of the things that I see that's been done, and I think that was really wrong, to uh, leave the rural areas wide open to the Taliban. And that, that, that I think, now that, uh, not only the Afghan people, but also I think the international uh, community will play, pay, play, pay a very high price as, as, as simply because, as I think, you no, know, uh, this is the first time that actually an erstwhile terrorist group has managed uh, to gain uh, the leadership of Afghanistan and also uh, lay its hands on a, a very large amount of armaments and uh, also have a potential air force, uh, which uh, no uh, terrorist group, ISIS, uh, or the so-called Islamic State didn't have it, and Al-Qaeda uh, didn't have it. But now the Taliban has it. That's not to say that they will be able to operate the air force uh, uh, very quickly and so on. But then they, they will receive considerable amount of support from the Pakistani supporters, and uh, they will be operating it. In fact, uh, the, uh, the the resistance in Panjshir just a few nights ago uh, was uh, bombed uh, from the air and from the ground. And the Taliban do not really have at this point the uh, air force. And the reports uh, suggested that it was uh, 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 done by uh, drones. And the uh, Taliban do not have drones, so it must have been uh, really uh, with the aid of the Pakistanis. Mm. You both seem to be suggesting that um, Africa, that the Taliban do not represent a sort of nationalist wave, as we've seen, say, in Vietnam, with the linkage to uh, the Viet Cong and some sort of nationalist yeah. impact behind it uh, twenty-five years ago. What we're looking at now is something that's been linked by both of you to Pakistan and Pakistan's interest, yet the Pakistani government uh, several times over the last few days have been at pains to, uh, to stress they have nothing whatsoever to do with this, that they're no, not within a thousand miles uh, of the issue. Uh, Professor Maley, you're smiling. Yes, I'm smiling. Uh, in uh, the memoirs of the former U.S. Secretary of State, uh, George Shultz, there's an account of uh, a telephone conversation between President Reagan and President Zia-ul-Haq uh, of Pakistan after the signing of the Geneva Accords of 1988. And uh, Reagan somewhat ingenuously asked Zia how he would continue to aid...
various Mujahideen groups when he would promised in uh, the agreement he just signed not to do so. And Zia said, oh, we'll just lie about it. We've been lying for years about what we're doing in Afghanistan. And that should be uh, really posted on the notice boards of every policymaker in London, Washington, uh, Paris, Berlin, who happens to be dealing with uh, Pakistan. Uh, it, it's simply not the case that uh, anything that uh, senior Pakistani officials say about Afghanistan can be trusted for one moment. We have several players I involved in this. I mean, regionally, Afghanistan is uh, is central to uh, to several countries, and uh, and it was for some time there as a this was part of the reason why the U.S. was there. I mean, on the um, on the west, you have Iran. Uh, to the north, you have the Stans, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all of which are of vital concern. To Russia uh, on the east, Pakistan, as we've already indicated, um, we've got some idea from uh, Professor Cycle uh, of what Pakistan's interest is in here. It it simply wants Afghanistan in some ways as a shield for itself. Um, what are the other players in this game? We haven't mentioned China either, but let's just talk to those who have got sort of close and immediate borders, who may have. Um, interest in the game here, Professor Cycle. Well, Perhaps I think Iran. the fact that, well, I mean, the fact that Afghanistan is at the crossroads, it's a both a blessing and also a curse. It could be also a hub of connectivity or a uh, highway of uh, conquest and invasions. And that's what uh, really defines the historical evolution of Afghanistan in many ways. Uh, certainly, I mean, uh, Iran, uh, Russia and China uh, are absolutely delighted to see the back of the Americans, uh, you know, from the uh, region. And uh, uh, also not only the, you know, the United States being defeated, but also uh, humiliated uh, as much as possible. Uh, and for that matter, also uh, supposedly the world's uh, most uh, significant military alliance, that's NATO being defeated. I mean, it's not just that, uh, an American defeat, but also NATO's defeat. But on the other hand, I think the Iranians are going to be also cautious and the, 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 the approach to the Taliban, uh, uh, simply because, as you know, that uh, the, the, the Iran is a, a Shia-dominated state with a, a Shia-dominated government, uh, and uh, so Afghanistan, something like 15 to 20 percent of Afghan population is made up of followers of Shia Islam, and therefore mm -hmm. the Iranians will be quite concerned. In fact, the Iranian uh, uh, foreign ministry spokesperson uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Qudzada, who uh, was questioned uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of Afghanistan and on the report and that Pakistani drones may be may have been used in the attack uh, on the Panjshir Valley. Uh, and he said that uh, that is a matter of concern for them and they will launch an investigation to, uh, to see whether actually the Pakistanis were involved. And I think that also uh, basically highlighted that they are serious concern about the situation. I think the Central Asian republics would be sort of concerned simply because of that uh, uh, the victory, or, or this is how the world would really see it on the surface, is a victory for the Taliban. And uh, the, the victory of the Taliban could provide incentives for uh, a number of Islamic movements, uh, for example, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and so on, and also similar movements in Tajikistan. So, and that's why the, the Russians have now deployed that their uh, forces along the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan, and we, we basically because they are very much really concerned. Um, I think the Chinese are really very comfortable because they would be very. Uh, uh, because they are very close to Pakistan and they have a strategic relationship with Pakistan uh, and uh, um, they, they are very confident that, that the Pakistanis will be able to uh, moderate um, the, the, the Taliban as far as their uh, behavior towards uh, China uh, is concerned. And also Afghanistan has got a lot of untapped resources, mineral resources that, that the Chinese will be very much interested in. And they have already sort of announced a number of, uh, in the past, a, a number of projects that, that they would like to fund, including copper and uh, oil and so on. And I think they, they, uh, they would like to really they, uh, lay their hands on that. And of course, uh, China has also got a 25-year strategic 
an agreement or a cooperation agreement with I Iran. Uh, so there is a sort of a, a Beijing, uh, uh, Moscow, Tehran axis is developing. And then the Iranians have got enormous influence in uh, Iraq as well as in Syria and Lebanon. And if the Chinese really want to really tap or leverage uh, Iranian influence in these countries, then the uh, road is wide open for China to uh, have a, a sort of influence from Pakistan right across the Mediterranean. I'm not saying for a suggest uh, I'm not suggesting that this is really going to happen uh, in the next day or two, but I think that is something you you know potentially open to China, which really can do that. But uh, uh, let me also make this point that I think this the situation in Afghanistan is right is most likely to touch off a lot of regional rivalries over the country, but no, e e even afar from the uh, Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, for example, Qatar's involvement in the support of the Taliban and what they've really done since 2013 and now actually the, uh, helping the Taliban to, for example, open the Kabul airport and so on. And of course, also Turkey has joined forces with the Qatar and these two, but they are not, they are not really as much interested uh, in the welfare of the Afghan people or what really precisely happened to Afghanistan. They've got their own axe to grind in their rivalries with other countries. For example, Qatar would like to really show up to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia that it can really, uh, uh, you know, play a much bigger role than the size uh, would normally dictate. And of course, Turkey is also, uh, has, uh, under, under uh, Tayyip Erdogan, has got its own ambitions, at, uh, or at, at least uh, demonstrated regional ambitions, which the Saudis and the United Arab Emirates and some of the other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council absolutely resent. So now we are going to also see, a degree, and let's not forget that uh, Pakistan has historically has had very close relationship, and for that matter, strategic relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. And if the Qataris try to really undermine that, then of course uh, that is also going to uh, be another angle that will add to this sort of regional tussle over Afghanistan, and which which, which can affect also the domestic uh, situation of the country. Professor Maley, anything to add on that? Uh, well, it does drive home the extent to which the Americans are uh, sacrificing and in a sense walking away from what was probably the most pro-Western population in the entire region was uh, a gross strategic blunder on the part of uh, successive administrations, but particularly the Biden administration, which ultimately owned the decision for final withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, and which uh, has provided golden opportunities for other powers, many of which are not particularly friendly uh, to the United States to exploit under these circumstances. Of course, there's a wider issue that we can probably take up shortly about the extent to which this has done reputational harm to the United States in quite remote parts of the world, uh, where it would like to be trusted by those whom it's trying to court as potential allies for objectives such as the containment of China. Well, let's talk about that now, and I'll get you to continue on, on that theme. Um, let's talk, though, about first the, the immediate uh, withdrawal and the way that was handled, the sorts of damage that did to the United States. Many in the US are saying, yes, that's damage, but it's, it's largely cosmetic. It doesn't affect the real agenda because what Biden's real agenda is, is disengagement from Afghanistan so he can focus on the big picture of China, Russia, Eastern Europe, and the way the sort of broader US st strategic objectives need to be reoriented. Do you, your comment on that with regard to, first of all, the, <laughs> the immediate results of what happened in the way it happened? Well, clearly, the uh, 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 circumstances that surrounded the evacuations from Kabul airport were profoundly shambolic. The United States was not well prepared for that. President Biden, as a hostage of a whole range of statements that he'd made very publicly in the preceding weeks, which showed that he didn't understand the potential for a dramatic cascade that would undermine the position of the government in Afghanistan. And it showed really that he had little understanding of Afghan history, because if one goes back to the collapse of the communist regime in 1992, or the Taliban regime in uh, 2001, about a month 
elapsed in each case between the onset of the crisis for the regime and its final overthrow. So there was no particular reason to think that things would pan over over many months or even years in Afghanistan with the United States in effect having deflated the tyres on the uh, the Afghan army's uh, strategic capabilities. Um, and uh, th there was really very little uh, uh, excuse for such poor analysis. But I think one of the reasons for that was that the entire notion of um, a peace process, going back to the agreement that was signed with the Taliban on the 29th of February 2020, had led to the building of what um, Kate Clark of the Afghanistan Analyst Network called fantasy castles, where people were spending a great deal of time thinking about how women's rights might be constitutionally protected uh, in a regime where the Taliban were working with other Afghan political forces. And this uh, dreamy stuff led people to ignore the evolving reality, which was that the Taliban were pushing for a total military takeover. They were engaging in strategic stalling in the talks that were being held in Doha and really did nothing to make them succeed. And it was blindingly obvious for many months that this was where things were heading. Uh, and yet so many people had locked themselves into myth the mythology that there was a meaningful peace process in play that had left them bereft when finally the crunch came. Mm. Uh, I mean, cycle. Uh, let's talk then about this wider uh, damage. All right, it, it, tactically humiliating to the United States in the way it played out, but we're saying there's more than cosmetic damage here. What we're looking at is not just a change in strategic direction that suits the Biden agenda, but a change that could actually damage the Biden agenda in a wider, long-term sense. Well, I think uh, President Biden, uh, when he took uh, office, he identified China and Russia as the main adversaries of the United States, and therefore he will do whatever he could in order to stand up to these two powers, and to more specifically, of course, China, and to contain uh, the People's Republic of China. And of course, the West has also been very much worried, and particularly in the United States in that respect, about uh, the uh, Built and Road Initiatives. And uh, uh, of course, the Built and, uh, Built and Road Initiatives have already taken off, and uh, uh, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor has uh, become uh, very active uh, at the cost of uh, 45 to $50 billion investment on the part of China. Of course, the cost is really blow, uh, blown out. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, some, of, uh, some of the projects uh, have not been really completed. But now I think uh, the road is uh, really wide. Uh, uh, the road is wide open uh, for China uh, through Afghanistan as far as a, a Silk Road component of the Built and Road Initiative is concerned. And with the 25-year uh, uh, cooperation agreement that they have signed with uh, Iran, uh, which should not, which will not only bring in a lot of Chinese investment in Iranian in infrastructure industry, but also a very strong uh, military and intelligence cooperation between the two sides. And the Iranians would be very much receptive to uh, the, the uh, Silk and Road component projects to, to come to true, and they will be very happy to be really part of that. And of course, uh, Turkey is also very wide open to that. So, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, uh, President Biden uh, wants to really push for this pivot to Asia and therefore containment of China and all, all these sort of things. On the other hand, they have actually opened a new arena for China to expand its influence, which the United States now by vacating Afghanistan and the way they have done it, uh, they, 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 they basically um, to, told the Chinese that uh, you're most welcome to this part of the world. Uh, and, and of course, the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative it, it, it also includes uh, uh, the Middle East and uh, Africa, particularly through Morocco and so on. Uh, and uh, I think to me, it really appears that uh, they have really created a, a, a large space for China uh, to uh, operate. And also given the fact that there's very close uh, friendship between Moscow and Beijing, I mean, there can be really cooperation on that side. 
um, uh, 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 how uh, the United States is really going to uh, confront Russia, and particularly in Eastern Europe and so on. Uh, I mean, no, the, the, the important thing is that these Asian, if I could call it, Asian powers have really gained the upper hand. And the United States is on the uh, uh, backward and, and uh, uh, is going to be in a very defensive position. Mm. Uh, Professor one. Miley, yeah. 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 Uh, I just uh, get you to expand, and I'll get an observation on this. A number of commentators have uh, have said, "Look, there is immediate damage and embarrassment to the United States, but long term, uh, the U.S. is is a solid friend, and we all know that in uh, diplomatic relations, uh, there are no allies, only interests." Um, what's your observation on that? Has the U.S. done? wider damage to its long-term relationship with many of its allies? Yes, I think it has. Uh, American commentators are, in my experience, quite poor at understanding how the United States is seen in the wider world. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's pertinent under these circumstances. Uh, where I think the US has a particular problem at the moment is in contrast to the situation when Saigon fell in 1975, the US domestically is in a much more problematic state now than was the United States in, in April of 75. Um, it was in the well into the post-Watergate recovery phase. By then, uh, Gerald Ford as president of the United States may not have been the brightest bulb in the batch, but he was respected across the uh, political aisles in uh, Washington. He'd been a congressman since 1948. Uh, and uh, it shouldn't be forgotten that Democrats and Republicans had ultimately come together in the Congress to force Nixon's resignation in August 1974. It's a very different scene now. The Republican Party has been the subject really of a hostile takeover by extremists using the uh, uh, primary election uh, approach. Uh, this reached its uh, zenith with the attack on the uh, Capitol on the 6th of January this year. It seems quite likely that the Republicans will recover control of uh, both the House of Representatives and the Senate in the midterm congressional elections at the end of 2022, which would restore gridlock uh, to the American political mm. system. And uh, the combination of a gridlocked and dysfunctional domestic system and disastrous blundering of the kind that's been associated with the diplomacy with respect to Afghanistan and then the uh, extraction of forces from Afghanistan really would have to raise uh, in the minds of anyone who wasn't completely demented questions about just how reliable the United States could be as a, as a partner. In, in a sense, the lesson of Afghanistan is that the United States will hold the line only until through its own domestic processes it reaches the conclusion that it can no longer be bothered doing so. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, it's, uh, it's unlikely to be able to rely on alliance partners other than those that are uh, acculturated to obedience or which are locked into very tight alliance relations of the kind that exist between uh, the United States and Japan. But if they're trying to build ad hoc coalitions at the margins for things like the containment of China, then they need to watch their step. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to turn now to uh, some questions we have from um, many of our viewers who've, uh, who've uh, been busy sort of asking their own questions and have typed them into us. Uh, but somebody's got a, a personal question that relates to you. I wish to find out the welfare and whereabouts of my friend Mahmoud Cycle, brother of Professor Amin Cycle and former ambassador Afghanistan to Australia. He is fine and well. He is uh, now uh, back in Canberra. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, the next question, Professor Mali, if we look at India, it's a multicultural nation. Yeah, there is some level of national unity. What's India's game here? And what's India's interest with Pakistan and then Afghanistan? How does it affect India? Uh, India so far has been relatively quiet compared to some other states in pronouncing on the situation in Afghanistan. But given its long-standing rivalry with Pakistan, it will be extremely unsettled by the uh, course of events. Uh, whether this actually plays out into the dynamics of the so-called quad is a different kind of question because the Indians also have reasons to be sceptical about mm. China. But I wouldn't rule out the possibility that at some point in the future, if the Taliban start looking 
um, fragile in their efforts to control Afghanistan. India might look for ways in which it could influence the situation to the embarrassment and detriment of the Pakistanis. Uh, but at the moment, they're, they're treading fairly carefully because so they don't have an enormous range of instruments at their uh, disposal to try to exercise control over the situation. But they're, they're certainly watching it very carefully. Uh, Professor Seichel, uh, there are a number of uh, other groups operating in Afghanistan, as we've indicated, Taliban are now the government, but there are uh, shadow groups like the remnants of ISIS and uh, other groups. Um, what are the odds that um, these are going to be problematic groups for the Taliban? Uh, our, uh, our contributor has suggested, are we looking at Terrestan in the future? Well, I think they are going to be problematic for Taliban, but of course also there are divisions among the, the Taliban themselves. And uh, let me first uh, talk about the uh, ISK, the Islamic uh, State of uh, Khorasan. Um, the, they've been responsible for some of the very horrific uh, operations in Afghanistan, which has uh, proved to be very costly in terms of both uh, uh, civilian lives and uh, the, the, the fatalities among the security forces in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and of course, the Taliban really don't want uh, the ISK on their terms. And uh, therefore, I think the ISK probably will now find more space in Afghanistan uh, to increase its strength in operations. And we know that, for example, the ISK was responsible uh, for the recent bombing at the Kabul airport. And they would have probably carried out the more uh, attacks uh, if they had uh, the opportunity. Um, and I think if, uh, from the, this point, they are going to uh, be in a position to uh, uh, increase uh, their operations against uh, the, uh, the Taliban. Uh, but of course, there's also going to be uh, national resistance. Of, um, and that, that has already been uh, gathering pace uh, under the leadership of uh, Ahmed Massoud, uh, the son of the uh, late uh, 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 Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was uh, the Mujahideen commander and uh, fought the Soviets uh, uh, for years and then after that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And of course he was assassinated just uh, two days by Al-Qaeda agents, uh, two days before 9-11. Um, I think uh, um, the, uh, although the Taliban have claimed that they've taken over uh, Panjshir, but I think uh, the you know, fighters of the, uh, the National Resistance Front led by Ahmed Massoud are still in the mountains and they will continue uh, fighting. And Ahmed Massoud had issued a statement uh, last night calling uh, on the uh, Afghan public to rise against the Taliban. And as a result, uh, the, the night before last night, and as a result, there have been uh, demonstrations in Kabul, Herat, Mazar Sharif, and so on. And particularly, it's also very significant to point out that, that these uh, demonstrations uh, had been led by women. In, in the country, and of course they have only been dispersed when the Taliban have uh, um, fire shots, particularly uh, I mean in the air, and so uh, and so on. But there's also going to be a lot of criminal gangs which have been operating in Afghanistan for a long time, and then the, uh, and they will also find that the opportunity in space for uh, uh, regaining their strength in one form or another, whether it's in terms of drug traffickers or and Taliban probably will be part of that in order, uh, because that's a major source of revenue for them. Also people smugglers and, and so on. But there's going to be also, I think, divisions between the, the Taliban. So you've got the, you've got the Kandahari, uh, Kandahari faction you know, on one side, that, uh, that they would like to really claim that, that they are the main faction and therefore they would uh, 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 entitled to rule Afghanistan. But then you've got the Mashriqi and the people from Eastern Afghanistan, from Patika, from Jalalabad, and so on. And Haqqani really belongs to this side. Although they all come, or they hail, um, uh, mostly from uh, uh, the Ghazai tribe of ethnic Pashtuns. Uh, 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 but there are major regional differences uh, between them. And the Haqqani network has actually the uh, security of Kabul under their control. And their leader has become the interior minister. And he's the one that is uh, also on a, a terrorist list of, of the um, uh, FBI and, and, and therefore some of the uh, allies of, of the United States. So the, one cannot really automatically assume that the Taliban are going to really remain a united uh, body or a united uh, group uh, either. 
and, and, and we saw this. I think there's going to be division between the Taliban leaders and their commanders and foot soldiers uh, on the ground, whereas uh, some of their leaders have become more worldly simply because uh, they have been traveling and they've been uh, negotiating in Doha for, for many years and they've been uh, treated uh, very luxuriously by the Qatari government and they've seen the five-star hotels and all these sort of things in some of the other countries, like whether they've been to Russia or Iran or this and that. But the, command, uh, the, uh, the, the, the commanders and foot soldiers, most of them have been very narrowly educated in, uh, in Islam in the Pakistani madrasas. And they have never really experienced uh, urban life or city life or uh, they, they have been through the, uh, the uh, 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 cultural and social settings. No, of the urban centers. Uh, so so uh, what the Taliban leaders are saying in terms of inclusive government, of course, as it was pointed out, it's, it's not really inclusive at all. Um, or in terms of you know allowing women to uh, be educated and work and this and that and so on. I mean, these are all part of a public relations campaign. And this is to really gain as much international recognition as possible. And the Pakistanis are working very hard on this because the Pakistani foreign minister has been traveling to the, all the uh, capitals of the neighboring states and trying to really pursue them that look, uh, this is really a, a very genuine movement, and therefore now Afghanistan is going to be more stable and more secure, and therefore, uh, and it's not going to be a headache for any of us, and so on. But whether the Afghanistan's uh, um, neighbors and for that matter, some of the other regional actors will fall for that, I mean, remains to be uh, to, to, to be seen. Uh, but I think uh, one could also expect that, that there's going to be a lot of divisions within the Taliban as, uh, uh, as well. One point that, uh, mm. it's it's the following that uh, when uh, Western agencies have uh, and media have talked about a government in Afghanistan, a new government, they probably should be saying regime because a government is a combination of people and a functioning state. And it's actually not clear to what extent the instrumentalities of the state that had existed up to this point have survived the transition for two reasons. One is that a great deal of the senior and mid-level staff that have been responsible for the operation of state instrumentalities have either left or they're planning to leave or have been told not to come to work because they're women. Uh, and it's a bit like trying to run a, a postal service if you only have the posties but no one else uh, to uh, ensure that the mail gets delivered. The other problem is that it's far from clear that funding will continue uh, for agencies in uh, the uh, the Afghan state that have been funded internationally by sub to a substantial degree up to this point. In fact, it seems more than likely that a great deal of that aid will be cut off. And if you have uh, a state structure which has uh, lost a great deal of its staff and lost a great deal of its cash, then it may well be that you will find a regime which is struggling to perform any of the key responsibilities that are typically associated with the state regulation of behavior or redistribution of resources. And if that's the case, it creates open space for groups like uh, uh, Islamic State, which may well want to symbolize the incapacity of the new rulers to provide protection for the population. That's one reason I think that just as was the case in the year or so after the Iranian revolution, we may see bombs going off here and there, uh, detonated by people who want to destabilize those who are trying to claim power in the new political space. Mm. Uh, Professor Maley, you've uh, indicated briefly, tangentially, the implications that this could have for America's long-term relationships with NATO and its its other uh, close allies. And of course, one of the members of NATO is Turkey. And Professor Cycles commented briefly on Turkey. Do you have any observations on what's in this for Erdogan? Well, Turkey does have a relatively long uh, history of recognizing relatively swiftly regimes that uh, come to uh, power in Afghanistan. But I think they would need to tread very carefully under these circumstances because if the Taliban are still in uh, a febrile condition, uh, states that might rush in uh, to try to uh, find space in uh, a new Afghanistan would run the risk of getting their fingers burned very seriously. Uh, and uh, if, if I were Erdogan, I would be uh, pretty careful about engaging with the Taliban uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, it seems to me that a lot of observers outside Afghanistan are overestimating the extent to which the Taliban uh, have managed to consolidate their power within uh, 
uh, Afghanistan. It's very early days for them. Um, the kind of force that they have used in order to eliminate their opponents is not the kind of force uh, that is actually required to exercise control. And it's worth remembering the comment that Edmund Burke made in the 18th century when he, he said a, a, a people are not governed that have to be perpetually conquered. Uh, and that is uh, a pretty good encapsulation of the situation in Afghanistan just now. Well, we're reaching the uh, appropriate final moments. And Professor Cycle, perhaps you could give us your uh, comment and perhaps some closing remarks from your perspective. Well, I think uh, just in the last comment, I mean, the, that is true that I think uh, uh, Erdogan has to be very uh, cautious and very careful. But he's already indicated that he's uh, willing to engage the Taliban and uh, he's already indicated that, that he will be willing to participate in the operation of the Kabul airport and uh, so on. And then when he was asked in a press conference, you know, that, that, does the Taliban really worry you? I mean, the cooperation with the Taliban. And he said, well, this is diplomacy. You know, that's, I mean, that's fine. And so my, my, my feeling is that I think, uh, uh, you know, the Erdogan the world or has already has joined forces with the Qataris in uh, sort of a joint operation and Afghanistan. And, they, and the Qataris were also likely to provide uh, uh, some financial support. And so with some of the other, let's not, uh, let me also make this point that many of the people in the Arab world, not necessarily talking about the Gaza, but I mean the people in the Arab world, they were very quite happy about the, the quote unquote Taliban success in Afghanistan. So, because they have been so much disillusioned with the United States and what the United States have really done in the region in terms of invading Iraq, uh, 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 not resolving the, uh, uh, providing unqualified support to the state of Israel against the Palestinians and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and providing support for the Arab coalition operations in Yemen and what has really done the, the devastated that country. I mean, the Arabs have got their own grievances, the Arab peoples, and therefore, they would really see the success of the Taliban as um, a, 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 through their uh, um, dislike of the United States, and that is that, and that is also uh, very worrying. You know, the, uh, and whether the Washington is really fully uh, aware of this really situation, I'm, I'm sure they, they are. But that, that, that's going to be also backlash. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's not a lot to I can say towards the end. I mean, apart from the fact that, that uh, look, Afghanistan is in a a uh, very uh, dire transition, a very, very difficult one. Um, I think the only thing that can know uh, the international community can do is to keep up the pressure uh, on the Taliban and uh, support the Afghan people, and particularly uh, the um, resistance, which is uh, most likely to gather pace. Uh, of course, not, uh, you know, not going to be nationwide immediately, but over a period of time, I think that is really likely to expand, just in the same way that it sort of expanded, you know, against the, so, uh, against the Soviet occupation of the, of the country. Of course, this time, really, you know, no power is really behind the uh, Afghan people. Uh, but that's not to say that a number of countries are not terribly concerned about what is really happening to Afghanistan in terms of their own interests. I mean, one can really respect uh, India and for that matter, the Iranians, and to some extent, even the Russians and so on, uh, to uh, uh, finally come to the conclusion that perhaps it is not a really good idea to uh, uh, let the, uh, the Taliban to have a, a free ride in Afghanistan. We're really running, running very close to time now. Professor Maley, uh, just a very brief um, uh, final wind-up comment, if you like. And, and what should we be looking for in the next two or three weeks if we're interested in, in getting a feel for what's happening? Uh, I think we should be watching to see what demonstrations take place within Afghanistan because that's probably the most immediate threat which the Taliban regime faces. Slightly longer term, I think we also need to be watching for the inspirational effects in different parts of the world that may flow from the Taliban takeover and the American exit. Uh, this, uh, When the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, it stimulated a narrative amongst religious radicals that the lesson was that uh, their brand of religion was a force multiplier that could defeat even a superpower. That's circulating again, and it potentially has an audience in places like Indonesia, the southern Philippines, um, yeah. uh, parts of Malaysia, southern Thailand. Uh, the Americans, I think, don't really think about these kind of things at all, but they're certainly things that Australia should consider very carefully.
William Ali, I'm in cycle. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us this evening. And now for some closing remarks. I'd like to introduce Ms. Marina Nwabi. Marina graduated in law and politics from the University of Kabul. She's a Master of Policy and Social Research from Macquarie University and has worked on women's rights as a team leader with USAID. And from 2007 to 2009 was responsible for coordination of women's groups to facilitate uh, women's political participation in Afghanistan. Marina, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Mr. Kaleni, for the introduction. Uh, yes, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of Masood Foundation Australia to thank uh, Mr. John Kaleni for moderating the panel tonight and thank our speakers, Professor Amin Saikal and Professor William Miley for their valuable time and insightful analysis of the current situation in Afghanistan. And I'm hopeful that webinars like this will help us gain international attention, advocate for our people, and give them a voice. And I would want to also express my gratitude to the organizers and partners, Advocates for Dignity, and Masood Foundation in Australia for putting together such an important and informative webinar. And uh, I would like to also thank our technical team at the background of the webinar. And in summary, as we all know that Afghanistan at the moment is facing humanitarian crisis and what we want from the international community, communities is to put pressure on your government to refuse to recognize the Taliban's Islamic Emirate, which is a radical Islamic form of governance in Afghanistan. And also to put pressure on the United Nations Security Council, European Union, and other international mechanism to take the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan seriously, and to closely monitor the Taliban's behavior to ensure that they respect human rights, women's rights, freedom of expression, media freedom, and all of Afghanistan achievements over the last two decades. And the last, we want to put on your government and international community to provide humanitarian assistance or aid to the people of Afghanistan. And let's fight together for a world free of violence, terror, and radicalism. And thank you once again, everyone, for attending the webinar this evening. And I hand it over back to Mr. John Clary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marina. And on behalf of Advocates for Dignity, I'm John Cleary. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Advocates for dignity and try and help people. But Washington says Turkey failed to present any evidence. Mr. Malcolm Shafi started to attempt to destroy democracy. Mr. Malcolm Shafi started to destroy democracy. Mr. Malcolm Shafi started to destroy democracy. I condemn this and I still condemn it.